All right. Hello, everyone. I'm hoping Andrea will uh, join me in just a second. Um, hi. Hey. hey, Andrea. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to week three of Sharks to Kids webinars. Um, we've had some great, great um, panelists in the past couple of weeks, and we're very excited about this week, starting with Andrea. Um, so, um, as always, if you have any questions today, please leave them in the Q&A section. Try and keep them relevant to Andrea's presentation. Um, we have an introduction to sharks coming later on today, so you can ask all your questions, general questions about sharks. Then today is about sawfish, and I'm super excited. Um, Dr. Andrea Kretz that we have here today is a um, research scientist, uh, research fisheries biologist um, in Florida. Um, she studies uh, sawfish and she's also studied them in the Bahamas, which is super cool. Uh, so many of our guests in the past have had so many things to say about the Bahamas. It's really the place to be for shark research. Um, so Andrea, um, just why don't you introduce yourself in a little bit more detail and then sure. we can get started. Um, well, I actually have a slide to introduce myself if we would rather do that. So you can see pictures. Okay, well, um, I just want to say good morning and thank all of you for joining me today. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you about sawfish. And if you can't tell from my wall decal in the back, um, I really love this um, incredible group of fish. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get started. Go for it. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Perfect, yes. Okay, so uh, to introduce myself, um, as Jenny said, I'm a research fishery biologist and ecologist with the National Marine Fishery Service in Panama City, Florida. Um, so my research, I'm focused, at, focused in on habitat use, movements and migration patterns of fish, predator-prey interactions, trophic relationships, and what that means is diet and food web, food web interactions. Um, and I'm interested in the role that fish play in their respective ecosystems. So my research itself involves a combination of being in the field, going out and catching and tagging these animals, as well as being back into the lab and processing data, um, writing manuscripts, and talking to all of you guys about my research. So I'm going to get started about sawfish. So I'm super excited about sawfish. This is such a fun group of animals. Um, so sawfishes belong to the family Pristidae, and they are a very small but charismatic group of very large batoids. So a batoid is a ray. Um, so you can see that these sawfish are dorsoventrally compressed. And so that means they're compressed from top to bottom. So they're kind of flat. So some of us scientists refer to them lovingly as flat sharks. Um, they spend a lot of their time on the bottom. You can see these two um, sawfish here are resting on the bottom. Um, and if you notice that the, uh, there's this long, basically hedge trimmer appendage coming off of the front of their face, uh, this is called a rostrum. And this is how the sawfish gets its name. And I'm gonna go into more detail about the rostrum here in just a little bit. So first, what exactly is a sawfish? So you might've heard saw shark and thought it was the same thing. Um, you might have heard recently that there were a couple of new species of saw shark that were re recently um, discovered. And I'm pretty sure that there is a really cool saw shark talk coming up later this week. So tune in to hear more about that species. Um, but saw sharks and sawfish are related. Um, they both have skeletal systems that are made of hardened cartilage. Um, but a saw shark is a shark and a sawfish is a ray. Um, and just looking at these two photos, uh, one thing that you might be able to point out a difference is in the top photo of a saw shark, they have these really long two barbells that are coming off of that nose or that rostrum, whereas a sawfish does not. But one of the main ways to tell a ray apart from a shark is the placement of the gills. So saw sharks have their gills located on the side of their body, whereas sawfish they have their gills located on the ventral or the underneath side of their body. So sawfish have all the basic same anatomy as sharks do. Um, they've got the 
dorsal fin. They've got the pectoral fins that are used for lift and for steering. Um, they've got the caudal fin that will help propel them through the water. Um, they also have um, ampullae of Lorenzini. Some of you might know what those are. Those are those little electroreceptors that sharks and rays have um, that can pick up electrical pulses um, of fish and other animals, um, and that can help them locate their prey. Um, something else interesting about soft fish is the location of their mouth. So their mouth is located on the ventral side. And some of you might be thinking that, okay, they have this long appendage with teeth and they have a mouth. The mouth is where clearly they eat their food. Um, I'll get into what the rostrum is used for here in just a second. But I want to show you this up close picture of what a sawfish mouth looks like. And it's really cool. So they have rows and rows and rows of teeny tiny little teeth. Um, they primarily eat fish, so that means they're piscivorous, but they also eat um, crustaceans like crabs and shrimp. Um, and here's a, a jaw of a green sawfish. This is a really large sawfish. You can see that um, there's just a wide distribution of all those tiny teeth and little rows and kind of like little crushing plates. So Worldwide, there are five species of sawfish. And if you take into consideration how many different species of rays there are, approximately 650, only five of those are sawfish. So that in and of itself makes this group of animals very, very unique and special. Um, so all five species grow to be at least 10 feet long. There's four species that can reach up to 16 feet. And then the largest species can be about 22 23 feet long. And that is a large, large, large fish, um, especially when you consider they have that long toothed, very sharp rostrum off the front of their face. So the habitats that sawfish use um, are typically tropical and subtropical regions. Um, they both, or they use freshwater systems. So the large tooth sawfish is sometimes called a freshwater sawfish. Um, that can be found um, in freshwater systems like in Australia. Um, but sawfish also inhabit coastal and marine um, and estuarine waters. And estuarine just means it's a mix of fresh and salt water, so it's kind of brackish water. So of the five species, there are four that live in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and that region is outlined here in the red box. Um, all four of those can be found in the northern coast of Australia, which is really unique. Australia has a lot of cool, <laughs> cool animals. Um, there's two species that live in the Atlantic Ocean, which is um, outlined by the blue boxes. And this is the small tooth sawfish and the large tooth sawfish. But in the United States, currently, there is only one species that can be found. And this is the small tooth sawfish. And they can be found within um, that very small red box that I have highlighted um, in around Florida and in the Bahamas. Um, and this is the species that I focus my research on because I work in South Florida. Um, and this is the species that we have. So sawfish are super unique in that there's very few of them um, in terms of species, but also they are the only living rays with a toothed rostrum. So this rostrum is used in killing their teleos prey. Um, as I mentioned, they have um, those electroreceptors, those ampullae of Lorenzini, and they're very, very dense on the ventral, that bottom side of that rostrum. So they can sweep their rostrum from side to side along the benthos, and they can pick up those electrical pulses from fish, and this helps them detect their prey. Um, you can see um, from some of these pictures, um, oftentimes when we go about and doing our research, we catch sawfish that have these very large teleos or fish scales stuck to their teeth. And you can see that that's very easy to do when they slash their rostrum from side to side like that. Um, so this is an animal that um, my colleague Dean had um, doing some research on. And so we had this animal secured to the side of the boat. Um, but you can still see how very quickly that sawfish can swipe its rostrum from side to side. Um, so they can swipe a school of fish um, and very easily wound those fish with those very sharp rostral teeth. And then they can come back around and eat those fish with the mouth that's on the ventral side of their body. So in addition to helping them find and um, procure prey, uh, they can use their rostrum to defend themselves from predators. And sawfish do have predators. 
Sorry, I forgot I, I added these pictures in this morning. Um, I also wanted to note that in addition to eating uh, bony fish chilios, uh, we have seen sawfish that have been uh, have consumed sharks as well. So this picture on the right hand side, you can barely see it. That is a uh, the tail of a Atlantic sharp nosed shark, about a three foot long shark that this very large small tooth sawfish consumed. I um, mean, you can see that the picture on the left hand side there, those very clearly, those are rostrum swipes on that shark. Okay, so getting to predators of sawfish. Um, sawfish do have predators. Um, they are particularly more susceptible when they are juveniles to becoming prey for larger animals, such as crocodiles, bull sharks, and even lemon sharks. Um, so this photo was taken, this um, came out um, in the literature a year, a couple of years ago, I think, of this crocodile eating a large tooth sawfish. It's a juvenile. Um, and then in the bottom right hand photo here, this is a bull shark that's eaten a sawfish. And you can see that that rostrum is sticking up from um, its esophagus. Um, and in that bottom picture, there is um, actually two lemon sharks that, um, that were observed in Everglades National Park um, attacking and presumably eating that poor sawfish with its rostrum sticking up. So although that rostrum is quite a formidable weapon, um, these sawfish are susceptible to becoming prey, um, especially when they're small. So something else very unique about the rostrum of sawfish is that each species has a distinct rostrum. So that means that um, you can maybe see on the left-hand side that the shape of the rostrum is different. Um, the number of teeth on either side of the rostrum is different. And um, the size and the spacing of the teeth is also different. So sawfish do not have paired teeth. So when we do our research and we catch sawfish, we actually count how many teeth are on either side of the rostrum. And that can help us um, um, identify the species of sawfish. Um, also, if we are just presented with the rostrum or if someone sends us a rostrum for a photo um, identification, we can use the tooth counts in the spacing and the shape of that rostrum to identify the species. Um, something else super cool about sawfish is that their rostrum can make up about 20 to 28% of their body length, which is about one third. So I mentioned that the larger sawfish gets up to about 22, maybe 23 feet. So seven feet of that is that toothed rostrum, which is super sharp. So I find that to be very cool. Some might find that intimidating, but I mean, I just think that makes the, these animals that much cooler. So unfortunately, all five sawfish are listed on the United States Endangered Species Act. Um, they are also listed as either endangered or critically endangered on the IUCN Red List. And for those of you who might not know what endangered means, it means they're at risk for extinction or being completely gone, disappeared. So once we lose a species, it's completely gone. That means it's extinct. So all five of these species are threatened with extinction risk. Um, the small tooth sawfish, which is in the photo here, uh, Pristis pectinata, this was the first native marine fish to be listed on the U.S. Endangered Species Act, and we actually had our 17th listing, our 17 year listing anniversary last week. And I can say since we started doing research on um, small tooth sawfish and just sawfish in general, we've learned so much since they were listed um, over the last 17 years. So the primary reason that sawfish populations have been in decline is human interaction. So those teeth on the rostrum can very easily become entangled in netting. So the sawfish on the top right is, I'm sorry, excuse me, top left, is um, a small tooth sawfish that is caught in a shrimp trawl net. Um, those rostral teeth can also very easily become entangled in gill nets and lines. And once those sawfish become entangled, it's very difficult for them to free themselves and they oftentimes die. Um, humans also have played a role in terms of habitat loss. So mangroves are a very important part for juvenile sawfishes as part of their critical habitat. Um, you know, humans coming in and developing coastline and ripping those mangroves out um, really affects the populations of these fish. Um, in addition, fishing mortality has played a role as well. So you can see from that bottom right hand photo, all of those sawfish that were caught and lined up. Um, sawfish in many countries are caught and their fins are sold for a high price. Their meat is sold and consumed. And also their, their rostrums will be cut off and kept as um, souvenirs. 
So all of these things combined has all contributed to the declines in sawfish populations worldwide. So although all five species of sawfish are listed as endangered or critically endangered, um, sawfishes are not protected in all countries. Um, so we can see here where the extant or the present current ranges for all five species combined is in the teal. And then the countries with no regulation or no protections at all are in red. Um, and this is something that us scientists and researchers are doing, uh, working together and uh, collecting as much data and information as we can so that we can work with legislators and try to get some protections enacted for sawfish in priority countries that don't have them, such as Cuba. I mean, we think that there's potentially um, populations of sawfish in Cuba, but there's no protections for them. So um, it's important for us to work with legislators to make sure that we um, can protect and conserve this very unique uh, group of species. Um, so I will say that um, sawfish are protected in the United States as well as Northern Australia. And we term these areas as lifeboats. And what this means is that we know that there are viable or reproducing populations of sawfish in these two areas. Um, and this, this may potentially um, be the areas where uh, the sawfish populations can be recovered because we can protect those habitats, we can put those regulations in, in action so that these sawfish have the opportunity to grow to maturity and reproduce more sawfish. So I do wanna note that there are a couple areas of critical habitat in the United States, and that is in uh, South Florida, in the Charlotte Harbor Estuary, and in the Everglades National Park. And that is the location where I focus my research on. So scientists together um, in collaboration, we are studying sawfish so we can help protect them. Uh, we do a range of research um, looking at what habitat sawfish use, estimating their populations. Uh, we can study their reproduction and hormones and stress physiology and genetic research. Um, all of these things are used in combination to understand the overall ecology of sawfish. So again, my research focuses on these small two sawfish. This is the species we have in the United States. And my work is concentrated in South Florida, but I also do research in the Bahamas, as Jenny mentioned, um, particularly around Andros Island. So this is a really cool video um, that my colleague took with a drone, and this is in the 10,000 Islands National Wildlife Refuge. So uh, these are two juvenile sawfish. These are only about one meter, maybe more than that long. And this is very, very shallow water. So this is maybe less than a foot of water. And this is what we deem as critical habitat and also a nursery area. Um, so you can see that the fins of those sawfish are very, very pliable and they can actually lay those fins down where they can get into super, super shallow water. And that's how they are able to avoid predators. Um, mangroves, as I mentioned, are very important for juvenile sawfishes, um, especially red mangroves. They have those really big, tall prop roots. And I've actually witnessed these sawfish are pretty agile with that rostrum going in and out of those prop roots. Um, so these are very important nursery areas for these animals. And this is something that we've learned over the last, you know, since the early 2000s, since my colleagues started uh, doing this research. Um, so I'm particularly interested in the habitat use and migration and movement patterns of sawfishes as they move through ontogeny. And that just means as they uh, move through maturity to, to reach maturity. And one way we can do that is using acoustic telemetry. Um, this is a really cool method. Um, we use passive acoustic telemetry, which means that um, we don't have to actively be out there on a boat tracking these fish. We can uh, come back at a later date and time and, and track them. So to explain quickly how this works, um, we have these coded tags that can last up to five and 10 years, which is pretty phenomenal, um, that we put in the abdominal cavities of sawfish and other fish. And then we have these listening stations that we put in the water called receivers. And when that fish with the tag passes within a certain distance of that receiver, the receiver can actually archive that unique fish ID and the date and timestamp so that us researchers can come back whenever we get a chance to download that data and we can see what animals have moved in the area, how long they stayed there, and if they left. So it's important to note here that telemetry is a very useful tool when researchers work together. So we have our own array out in South Florida, but we can't possibly track sawfish whenever they leave our array because they have to be within 
a close proximity to our receivers for us to be able to know where they are. And that's where collaboration comes in. Um, you can see from these two bottom photos that all of these dots are different arrays from other researchers who are studying other fish and mammal movements. Um, and the good thing about this is that we all use the same equipment, the same technology. So we can pick up other researchers' fish, they can pick up our fish, we share that data. So what we do is we put these uh, little acoustic uh, tags into the abdominal cavity of sawfish. So we turn them over on their backs, they go into tonic immobility um, like other sharks, they just kind of chill out. Um, we do a quick suture and then we set the animal free. Uh, we download our receivers about twice a year if we get a chance to get out there. And since 2016, that's when we started internally tagging sawfish, uh, we have tagged 57 small tooth sawfish with these tags. And that's a combination of tagging in South Florida as well as in the Bahamas. And because, because of these collaborative networks, we have detected sawfish on, I think the number's closer to 300 receivers right now, which is just absolutely phenomenal. We probably wouldn't have known the sawfish movements that we have now if it weren't for this type of collaboration. So this is just a, um, an idea to give you the type of data that we can get from the telemetry. So this is about a five foot male sawfish that we tagged in um, early 2017 up in the northern part of Everglades National Park. And through these receivers, we saw that this animal moved down into Florida Bay um, about a year and a half later, which was about 67 miles, which might not seem like a lot, but the previous research that we had indicated that the small sawfish stayed with usually without like a kilometer radius. And so these sawfish five feet are a little bit bigger, but it's actually giving us an idea of where these sawfish are going as they start to move out of the nursery um, and to the areas and the habitats that they're using as they grow and get closer to maturity. What's interesting is that we catch small tooth sawfish both in South Florida and in the Bahamas, but through our telemetry research and genetic research, we have not seen those sawfish uh, travel and go to the other location. So Florida sawfish stay in Florida and Bahamian sawfish seem to stay in the Bahamas. So from our data, we are um, coming to the conclusion that these are probably two distinct populations. And this is a cool video I wanna show you of a sawfish that we caught in the Bahamas in 2016. Um, some of you might've seen this already because it's just too cool. It's been on um, the Discovery Channel on Shark Week. But this is a um, four meter, about a 14 foot sawfish that we caught um, in Andros. Uh, we were super excited to begin with because this was the largest sawfish that we had caught in Andros. And it's also one of the four or five sawfish we've ever caught in Andros. Um, so she was special, but we also knew she was special because she had a tag under her dorsal fin, which is where we tag our animals, but the information rubbed off. So we weren't quite sure who she was. Um, this is Bianca right now. She's taken blood from the sawfish. As I mentioned, we um, look at stress physiology and hormones, and that's where she's collecting the blood. So we wanna get an idea if we're inducing stress on the animal or not. But this is the cool part here. So you might see that there's something moving in the cloaca of the sawfish. And we were incredibly stunned to see that she was pregnant and that these are two baby sawfish that were rostrum to rostrum. So because we needed to do tagging and we didn't wanna risk hurting the pups, um, my, my friend Dean here is probably the only guy who's ever played midwife to a sawfish. Um, and I have to note that this is the first time ever that a sawfish birth has been witnessed uh, for a small tooth sawfish, probably for all five species of sawfish as well. So we were over the moon ecstatic to confirm that pupping happens in Andros. We weren't 100% sure of that. Um, and also that we're able to, to get this amazing data. We took genetics and blood and measurements. We put little microchips like you put um, in your cat or dog so we can track that animal. Um, if we ever catch it again. So we saw that she, we helped her with two of the pups. She birthed five, um, but we felt that there were more in her, but uh, we didn't want to, you know, cause any more stress or anything. So we let her pup the ones that she pupped. We put our tags on her and let her go. Um, and what's super interesting is that later on, um, our colleague Kevin Feldheim at the Field Museum ran the genetics and in addition to her being the one pregnant female with pups that we witnessed, she was also a known sawfish to us. So she was caught 
almost 15 years prior in Bimini, where she was about an eight and a half foot sawfish. And then we catch her when she's um, a 14 foot sawfish. So we have some amazing growth data um, that we didn't pr uh, previously have. So Jeannie was our, we called her Jeannie, that's our sawfish name um, in uh, memory of Jeannie Clark. Um, so she is our prize sawfish um, and we are still getting data from her. And um, we estimate that she's currently about 22 years old. So these are, this is one of the, the little sawfish pups um, after we did our tagging. Um, and you can see it's, it takes it a minute, you know, to it kind of nose dives into the sediment a little bit, but then um, it moves on its way um, into its nursery habitat. So that's very exciting. So I'm just going to give you a couple of fun um, sawfish pupping facts. Um, so there are different modes of reproduction for elasmobranchs. So some can lay egg cases, some can give live birth, and then sawfish um, give live birth, but their embryos develop with a yolk sac. So the yolk sac um, is the source of nutrition. So as that embryo grows within the uteri of the sawfish, they use that yolk sac for nutrition. And once that yolk sac is completely absorbed, that sawfish is ready to be pupped. And what we saw in all five of the pups was that that yolk sac was absorbed. So they were ready, they were ready to be pupped. And we very likely caught her on her way in to these very shallow waters to uh, pup her little babies. Um, we now know that sawfish pups are born rostrum first. Um, we weren't exactly sure how that happened, but we now we know it's rostrum first and it's one pup at a time. So this is a photo of the two there's two uh, rostrum right there. So the sawfish are belly to belly. And you can see that a little bit better there where that first pup is coming out and that second sawfish rostra is sticking out of the cloaca. Um, something you might have noticed is that there is a covering over these fully developed rostral teeth. So as sawfish are born, their teeth are fully developed, but they have this jelly-like um, sheath covering the teeth, protecting both the mom and the pup. And you can see that there's all these little white lines. Maybe you can see that I'm translucent on the rostrum and those are those fully developed teeth. And then you can see that, um, that jelly covering. And that uh, gelatinous sheath will eventually wear away, probably maybe within the first week of life to expose those rostral teeth. So then that sawfish can uh, move on to finding and hunting its prey. Um, so sawfish, uh, small tooth sawfish are born at about 70 to 80 centimeters total length. And this is what we see in Florida. So uh, the Florida and the Bahamas population seem to be um, pupping at the same size. Litter size, um, definitely five that we witnessed, but we estimate it to be between seven and 14 pups. And the gestation or the pregnancy period for female small tooth sawfish is approximately 12 months. So I feel like I've gone on long enough, but I haven't even hardly scratched the surface of all the types of research that myself and my colleagues are working on with sawfish. Um, I haven't even touched on stress physiology. Um, we had a paper come out recently on the overall biology and ecology of the small tooth sawfish. Um, there's a paper out there on the um, reproduction and behavior of sawfish. And then overall, um, in the journal Endangered Species Research, there was a whole issue focusing on sawfish, and this is sawfish of the world. So there's information on all five species in there. Um, it's an open access issue. So if you're interested in learning more about other species of sawfish and more about small tooth sawfish that I wasn't able to cover, I encourage you to go and check out um, that journal. So I'll go ahead and wrap this up and say that um, sawfishes need your help. They are all endangered, although we are seeing signs of recovery, at least for small tooth sawfish in the United States, um, they're not out of the woods yet, so to speak. Um, they still need our help. So some things that you can do is uh, you can tell your friends and your family about sawfish. A lot of people don't even know what a sawfish is. Um, so if you can tell them about sawfish and, and why they're endangered and why they're so cool, um, that's helpful. You can participate in a local trash and beach pickups. Um, you, if you happen to be in Florida or somewhere else and you accidentally catch a sawfish, you can release it without bringing it on the boat, leave it in the water. 
Um, and up here on the screen, I have several different um, avenues that you can visit online to get more information about sawfish. Um, I could keep going, but I think I'm probably going to end it there. So I just want to thank you all for watching and joining, and I will answer any questions. Wow, thank you so much. That was so cool. I was like, wanting to answer questions but at the time at the same time completely obsessed with what you were saying those videos of the babies are so cool and I learned so much so thank you very much Andrea absolutely um I have some great questions that have come through um some of them you might have answered already but I'll just ask you again um so Nicole is asking and she isn't the only one there were a couple of people asking us how heavy do sawfish get Ooh, how heavy. Um, the big ones can be a couple, several hundred pounds, um, but I don't think we have a direct estimate of that. If we do, it's going to be from the historical record where, you know, they hang the sawfish up and they weigh them, but definitely several hundred pounds, those big ones. And they can, they, yeah, they get very big, don't they? They, they, they yeah. do, yeah. Small tooth sawfish can get to about 16 feet. Um, that's a very, that's a large animal. <laughs> All right. Um, then we had Caleb on um, YouTube who asked, you, you might have answered that already, but how long does the saw get? How long does the saw get? Okay. So the saw on, it's called the rostrum, uh, can be about uh, one third of the body length of a total sawfish. So if you have a sawfish that's 23 feet, seven feet of that is going to be that rostrum. That's all oh. the teeth. <laughs> Um, and obviously we still know very little about sawfish, but do we know, for example, how um, old they might live to? Sure, we do. Um, you know, we have an estimate for small to sawfish. So the oldest sawfish that was aged using the vertebra and doing ring counts was um, a 14 year old female. But as I mentioned, we have information on that pregnant female that we caught in, in the Bahamas. Um, so when she was originally captured, we estimated her to be about, uh, she was like a few years old, like four years old, maybe. Um, and so, as I mentioned in my talk, we think she's probably maybe around 22 years old now, and we are still picking up information on her. Um, and then large two sawfish, I know um, they're, they have been estimated or they have been aged to be about 40 years old. So they can live decades, but we don't have a definitive year for sawfish yeah very cool very cool um what's the biggest sawfish you've ever seen that would be that pregnant female yeah she was uh 14 feet yeah wow it's the coolest sawfish i've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> i bet that must have been such an incredible experience to be in the water with a, a pregnant female who was giving birth do you ever get scared when you're in the water with them um, no, never scared. Um, you know, we make sure we take the right precautions to secure the animal safely for the animal themselves and then for us before we ever get into the water with them. So, and I work with a really great team of scientists and we trust each other and I've never been scared. Yeah. And for anyone who watched the deep sea talk last week, um, Dean Grubbs gave it and that's one of your very, um, one of your team members, right? That's he right. Yes. And he's very experienced. So it must be a great opportunity to work with him and the rest of the team on this. It is. Um, so you, you talked a little bit about um, their migrations and how they move. Do they, mm -hmm. do any of the species do long migrations? They do. Um, so we have a graduate student who um, just defended a couple of weeks ago and she looked at the um, movements of large sawfish in South Florida. So small tooth sawfish again. Um, and they make quite long migration. So we have animals that were tagged in the Florida Keys that um, were picked up all the way up in uh, Georgia, off the coast of Georgia. Um, and then we've had some of those animals move into the Gulf of Mexico over in my area up on the Panhandle. So they do hundreds of miles of migrations. Cool. Um, yeah, because we had someone uh, say mention that they saw them in Jupiter of, uh, in February, March, but that was the only time they would see them. Do you know where they go when they're not in Jupiter? 
Um, well, we're still learning this. So we, we do know that there, um, that there are some sawfish that seem to aggregate around Jupiter. Um, and this is uh, part of the research that we would like to extend to. We haven't been able to sample up there yet um, or tag those animals. So if we were able to tag those animals off Jupiter and track them, then I can answer that question exactly where they go when they leave Jupiter. Great, okay. Um, Cody asks, Oh, no, I've asked you that, which is the largest sawfish that was that female? Um, why, why aren't they protected everywhere? You were talking about how there was some locations around the world where they weren't protected. Mm -hmm. Considering how critically endangered they are, what might be the reasons they, they aren't protected everywhere? Well, different countries have different legislations, right? And um, in some of these countries, you know, um, developing countries, sawfish are very high dollar, they can bring in a lot of um, food for a family and money for a family. Um, and so, you know, and that's a fisherman's way of life, but also, um, you know, some countries might not be concerned necessarily with conservation and ecology, um, but that's something that we're trying to work on and do more outreach and tell them, you know, legislators about sawfish and other endangered and threatened species that way they understand and they want to help and conserve these animals. Fantastic. Um, okay, Danielle asks, do you know how long they have been around for on Earth? Oh yeah, um, so sawfish, so they um, were around in like prehistoric times, so they were around in the, um, the Cenozoic era, so about 56 million years ago is when they diverged from, um, you know, uh, primitive sharks. Okay. Fantastic. That's a very long time. <laughs> it is. And there is, um, you know, a prehistoric sawfish that um, did overlap in the time of dinosaurs. <laughs> very cool. They've been around for a long time um, and unchanged. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's uh, one of the things I love about sharks. So, yeah. right. so how many, do we have an estimate of how many sawfish remain in the world today? We don't, but we do have scientists that are working on reconstructing population size by taking uh, tissue, some rostrum tissue of sawfish, because um, there are a lot of just rostrum out there. As I said, a lot of people um, will keep them as souvenirs, but um, we can use genetics and DNA to re, um, restructure the population. So we don't have an, an absolute answer yet, but I suspect um, relatively soon we'll be able to have an estimate probably. And, and spe speaking of people who go around looking for those uh, rostrum, if any of our attendees today know of somewhere where there might be one, can they record that observation somewhere? Can they, they point, point it out to someone? They absolutely can. Um, so the links that I had on my last slide, they can go to any of those websites. They can um, go to the sawfishconservationsociety.org um, in, in reach out to any of us scientists on their website and we can put them in touch with the right people. Um, so they can take pictures, they can send them, and then they can even potentially send the rostrum in for a sample. That way we can um, use their citizen science to help us along in our research. Fantastic. Okay, so what we'll do maybe is when we upload the video to YouTube, we'll try and put those links in the description below yeah. so that people can find it easily. Um, okay, so Manny asks, and you, this question might be one for the next talk on saw sharks, but um, you mentioned how bull sharks eat sawfish. Right. Do they also eat saw sharks? Do you know? I don't know. I think I have to tune in later this week to hear about saw sharks. <laughs> um, so we can ask Paddy that question a bit later on uh, this week. Um, and we, so people were amazed by the videos you were showing of the, the yeah. sawfish uh, giving birth. And some people were wondering through their lifetime, do we know, obviously, once again, we know very little about their reproductive behavior, but do we know approximately how many pups they can give birth to throughout their lifetime? Um, not throughout their lifetime. So we know um, for, saltu for small tooth sawfish, excuse me, um, that the estimated uh, length at maturity for females is about 12 feet. So she's probably about a teenager at that point. Um, and she can give birth to um, anywhere from five to say to um, 14 pups. 
And if they live on an order of decades, you can do some math there, they can give birth to potentially hundreds of pups. Yeah. Um, but obviously not all those pups will survive. Correct, yeah. There is gonna be some natural mortality from predators. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so Theo, age six, asks, do sawfish lose and replace teeth on their rostrum the same way that sharks do in their mouth? That's a great question. I'm glad someone asked that. Um, so the rostral teeth, um, if they break one, whereas if the base of the tooth is still intact, that tooth will grow back out and it will become pointed again. However, if that tooth is pulled out completely and there's no base left, then they will not replace that tooth. Okay, so they can't lose teeth and replace them just like sharks. They, not, not on the rostral, no, not on the rostrum. <laughs> um, can they eat turtles? Do we know if they eat turtles? Uh, they don't have the, the jaw structure for that, no. So it's primarily fish and crabs and crustaceans. Um, all right, so um, we have then some general questions about you and your career path, and maybe there are a lot of people watching who might be interested in doing, um, in going into work in marine biology, in shark science, conservation. And so I ask this to all of the panelists, do you have any advice for children who might want to one day do, um, go into marine biology? Sure, I say stay curious, ask questions, um, Educate yourself. If you're interested in something, seek out information on it. Um, you know, if you want to become a marine scientist, it doesn't mean you have to live on the coast. I am from Illinois. There is no coastline in Illinois. <laughs> but um, I, you know, I sought out internships and things that I could do that were on the coast because I was very interested in this. Um, and so I got hands-on experience. And this isn't true for for all research if you wanna do conservation. Um, but in terms of the type of research that I do, um, science and math is very important. It's very important to be quantitative. So um, do well in school, take your math and your science classes and never stop asking questions. Exactly, yeah, that's my advice as well. Definitely go out <laughs> and ask lots of questions. Um, which leads me to the final thing that I wanted to say um, before I say it. Andrea, thank you so much for today. That was a fantastic <laughs> talk. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm sure everyone watched it and learned so much about sawfish, which are a, an amazing animal um, that people know very little about. So thank you so much for your talk and for everything you do. And, and bouncing back on your advice of staying curious and going out looking for information, I really recommend to anyone watching that um, you all go out and um, look at the Sharks for Kids website, which I'm going to show you right now. Um, mm -hmm. It's a really great website where we have so much um, information for you guys, so many facts. Um, so let me show you. Um, and you might even find uh, some facts about uh, sawfish on there if you look uh, closely. So we've got some great resources for teachers. Um, and when you go back to school, maybe you can tell your teachers about this. Um, there's plenty on there for them, but for you students and children, there's loads of coloring sheets and crafts and some fast facts. So you can go down and look for all the facts about any species of sharks that you want. Um, and if the species is not on there, why don't you just shoot us a message and ask us and maybe we'll work on adding it to our, um, to our website because we're always working on improving it and adding more resources to it. So that's it from us. Uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Andrea. I can't thank you enough. It was really fantastic. Thank you um, for having me. Yeah, and we'll see you in an hour, just over an hour for the next talk, which is an introduction to sharks that I will be giving you. Going back to basics um, <laughs> and telling you all about what makes a shark a shark. Thank you, Andrea. All right, thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.